Everyone, I'm Zia Scaravallo from ZK Research, and I'm uh, back inside the WWT Hospitality Center at Dell Technology World 2023, and I have with me a couple of solutions architects. You're the technical people, right? So we had conversations earlier with some of the business people. Now, we're, now let's talk tech. Uh, so first up, uh, Steve McCall. Uh, you, you're a solution architect in the area of compute, right? So uh, maybe just a brief description of the uh, the areas that you uh, the, that you that you're proficient in. Sure. Yeah. So my background is a lot of data center infrastructure, storage, compute, virtualization, uh, networking. My role here at Worldwide Technology has me focused on the Dell PowerEdge portfolio and everything that goes along with that, such as OpenManage. Okay. That's a big portfolio too, getting bigger, right? It's growing. So, yeah. And uh, Mike Ambruzzo? So I'm responsible for uh, all things data protection and uh, the data protection end of like the cyber resiliency conversation. So um, basically ensuring that if the worst happens, you're able to get something back. So it's all the stuff that lives on the server in a way. Yeah. 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 So I'm responsible for the zeros <laughs> and ones. Yeah. Uh, that's it. That's actually a fascinating area because it's got so much applicability to so many other things. So, uh, but first let's all talk uh, the event itself. We're here at Dell Tech World. Uh, this is day two, right? We had a, uh, some keynotes yesterday. We had some keynotes today. There's been lots of customer interactions, I'm sure. Uh, what are some of the things that, uh, we'll start with you, that, that caught your eye, maybe surprised you, that um, you liked? I really enjoyed some of the remarks Michael made around AI in the keynote. Um, specifically, some of the things he was talking about where um, chat GPT in general, large language models are not going to be the solution to most of the business's problems. Right. Really, the idea of a specialty trained AI um, co pilot type concept to uh, help with specific business problems as opposed to just dumping everything into a large language model and playing what's the next word. Yeah, actually, I just uh, I wrote a blog about that that yeah. I'll make sure I include in the YouTube description below. But uh, the analogy I use, it's a little bit like search, right? We have general search with Google. Right. Uh, but if you're a law firm, you use LexisNexis, right? Exactly. And, and uh, e even if as a consumer, if you're trying to find information on, say, restaurants, you go to Yelp, right? And so the, that general chat GPT, uh, I think the way it works is something that we'll use in business, but the, the, the data that uh, you model it from will be unique to, in, to, to industries or even in some cases some some uh, uh, some right. companies. Yeah, especially for stuff that's proprietary. You know, yeah, I mean, you don't want all of that out into the wild. Yeah, yeah, and actually that in a lot of ways that helps with hallucinations and bad data and things like that because exactly. it is a curated data set. Yeah, precisely. Okay. And what about you? What, what are your some takeaways from from the event? So we continued on some past themes about edge compute. That was something that I was uh, particularly interested in from the keynote. Uh, there was a little bit more context added around that for really we're getting to the point of needing to provide personalized digital experiences. And we think about we might think about that in edge compute more in the consumer space that we need to make business decisions out at the edge. But also Michael mentioned an organization needs to kind of reimagine itself for the times that we're living in with AI as well. Uh, so not only is that going to drive edge compute for the customers, but also edge compute for businesses internally so that they can provide a different experience for their, for their workforce. Yeah, so how, how should companies think about edge? I, um, I was having uh, dinner with the CIO friend of mine and we were talking about edge and I asked if he has any plans and he goes, I don't really understand what that is. He goes, because every, I talked to a telco, it means one thing. I talked to Dell or whatever, who means another. I talked to a 5G operator, it means something else. So well, how do you define edge? It is, and, you, and so you need flexible solutions that can answer some of those different areas that, that it needs to go into. But I would say edge compute to me is having data ingested at the edge and having a decision made at that point rather than having you know the decision come back into the data center something like that or the and, cloud yeah or to the cloud yeah. and so this is all about fast decision making fast decision yeah. making and yes. what do you see as some of the the low hanging fruit use cases for edge like why why would a company look at that today some use cases probably manufacturing i think would be the the, the most common use case that we would see it right now for edge cuz if you think we we need to manufacture as fast as possible we have things going on an assembly line and we're trying to do QA process. So we have high-speed cameras 
that are looking at things coming off of an assembly line, we need to know right then if there's a product defect. Yeah, I've always said that the uh, uh, ultimate uh, sort of use case for Edge is the self-driving car. Because if you're going to decide whether to stop or not, you want that dining car. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? And we were joined by Hyundai during, yeah. the, uh, during the keynote, and that is one thing that they expressed was delivering that personalized yeah. digital experience more at the edge, right in your car. Yeah, and I think it's, it helps, helps people think about it that way. Now, uh, you both did breakout sessions here, right? Yes. And um, uh, so like, why don't we start with you? What, what was your session on? And, um, and uh, for, for people that maybe didn't get a chance to see it, uh, what were some of the key takeaways from it? So, um, yeah, I did about an hour on cyber recovery and cyber resiliency. Um, of course, I did the obligatory Dell Cyber Vault tech plug kind of explained how that architecture works and some of the important features. But the main thrust of the conversation was more generically around how we get to a cyber resilient solution in data protection. The traditional problem that we have there is the backup teams, the people that have been doing data protection forever, understand the problem, but they don't really have the money or the juice to fix the issue. The people in the security side of things that are really well funded now because of the ransomware situation don't really understand how data protection in a cyber vault is going to fit into that solution. And on both sides, when you come to them and say, we need to improve this, what they hear is, you're calling my baby ugly. The security people are hearing, yes, I'm going to fail and we're going to be attacked. The data protection people are hearing, well, the data protection stuff that I have in place now is not sufficient to this crisis. So getting all of those folks in a room organizing it and understanding that the solution has to be not about backup, but about the ability to recover. Yeah. Really, that's, that's the hour boiled down to about 30 seconds. So <laughs> this has been a, uh, I don't know, pet peeve maybe the right word, or something that's like, you know, stuck inside of me for yeah. the better part of uh, my IT career. So many vendors are great at backup. I was yeah. joking, nobody can do recover. Yep. Uh, and there's so many, uh, backup recovery systems that you do your PCs on one, you do your storage, right? And it just creates a long, drawn-up process. So when you have to recover from ransomware, mm -hmm. you, you wind up having to, uh, it takes months sometimes, correct? And, and, yeah. And, I mean, you know, and what's your goal there? How are you trying to improve that? Well, the important thing is to ensure that you have a copy that is essentially offline of the key data that's necessary to run the business, right? I mean, businesses have a huge amount of da data, but the stuff that you're not going to be in business if you can't give it back, the stuff that you have no choice but to pay the ransom if you can't get it back, that's what needs to be in your cyber vault. And then the other side of that is the stuff that you need to rebuild your shop. This is something that really resonates with a lot of customers and it's not always something that they think of, is the first thing you have to rebuild is all the infrastructure because it's gonna get wiped down to the ground. Yes. So having things like your Active Directory, having DNS, switch configuration, storage array configurations, nobody really thinks about that stuff. But that's the key critical rebuild that you have to put down before you can even start to bring you know, the databases and things like that back online. Yeah, and, and I talked to some customers and say, well, we do snapshots. But snapshots aren't enough, are they? No. Um, you know, in fact, I've been walking around for the better part of a decade saying snapshots aren't really backup. Yeah. Because you should get t-shirts that say that. Yeah, because it's not on a separate <laughs> platform, which means that if something happens that compromises that platform, you lose the whole array, you lose the snapshots with it. Um, so, you know, one of the keys to actually having a true backup of something is that it's on a different platform or a different kind of medium. And uh, I, I'm glad you brought up um, uh, the two different groups, right? One that looks at backup recovery and one that looks at uh, cyber. <clears throat> I, I actually wrote a blog this week where I talked about how those two functions need to be integrated and backup recovery should actually be part of every company's cyber strategy. And, uh, and are you seeing more of that? I'm seeing businesses that are successful at developing a full cyber resiliency strategy absolutely have to have those two parts of the business talking together. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's hope there's more of it. And if it doesn't come from the top down, if there's not buy-in at the highest levels, it, you're not going to succeed. Okay. And uh, so that's a good point for, if you're watching this, that this, it does need top-down a directive mm -hmm. here because it's hard for one group to subsume the other yeah. without that. Yeah, the places I've seen that really succeed are, are where you have that indeed. Now, Steve, what about your session? I, I poked my head in there a little bit and saw a little, uh, saw some of it. Yeah. Sure. 
my session today, I uh, presented on the Open Manage Enterprise plugin for VMware vCenter. OMEVV, so, -E I think, right? OMEVV yeah. is the is the acronym for yeah. that. Yes, it's a mouthful. Because yeah. Dell and VMware both love their acronyms. So. The, <laughs> and long ones, too. Yeah. Yes, yes. So what that plugin allows you to do is bring some of the hardware management and functionality into the vSphere console. So you just don't really have to be managing from different uh, platforms, from different uh, interfaces. It can also allow the hardware team to maybe give some control to the VMware team to be able to handle some of the own their own infrastructure. So. Yeah, and so that creates that you know, long sought after single pane of glass, if you will, versus having to run them separately. That's what we're always trying yeah. to do. Yeah. Uh, so we can do bare metal ESX deployments that we demoed uh, in my session. Uh, but the one thing we can do is integration with the VMware lifecycle controller. And this will allow the vCenter <laughs> administrator to handle the ESXi image and do the firmware management of the server. So if you think of an upgrade cycle, Sometimes it's the VMware team that handles theirs in their own maintenance window, and then the hardware team that handles theirs in their own maintenance window. Well, why not do them both at the same time? Yeah, why not, I suppose. Uh, now, I know at the show they announced some new hardware, uh, and earlier this year they announced the 16G PowerFlex as well. Uh, what's customer feedback been on the, on the new product? Uh, uh, new product, so it's introducing new processors. Uh, we're getting a four socket box yeah. back. That's something uh, that we haven't had since 14th generation. So I think that's going to have a lot of excitement for workloads that would benefit from a four socket. And what do you see some of those workloads being? Uh, a lot of database heavy applications. Uh, now the processor manufacturers too, one thing they're doing is building a lot of accelerators into the silicon. So that's also enabling some enhancements with the software workload that would run on top of it, such as a database. Yeah, uh, all right. And um, uh, what about for AI workloads, since we started off talking about that? Uh, what is that, how does that, because Michael actually referenced this in his uh, keynote, uh, that it, they really have to change the architecture, even the way they build the products, right? And so, yeah. what do you see for hardware requirements there? Well, a AI is shaking things up uh, because it is how do we do the compute? Is it the traditional linear way of doing processing? Is it more something that benefits from a GPU type processor architecture? Uh, and I think you're going to continue to see that as, as the needs of AI develop, I think the silicon manufacturers will figure out ways to help enable the acceleration on those platforms. Yeah, and it's interesting too, because the kind of processors that you need for training are different than what you need yeah. for inferencing, right? And so it does create a little bit of difference in how you, you operate those things. Mm -hmm. uh, now, one thing I wanted to ask you both about was the uh, Advanced Technology Center in St. Louis. Uh, actually, you have several of those around the country. Um, the types of you know, simulation you did here and you know, some of the training you do, you can, uh, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, uh, how, how, can you, how can customers leverage the ATC to be able to do that? Sure. Yeah, so <coughs> the session that I uh, did today with OMEVV, I did run it on hardware that we have in the ATC, so an MX7000 uh, chassis environment. And the way you access this is through WWT.com. So customers can go out, register for an account, and they're able to see all the things that we're doing inside the ATC articles, proof of concepts, as well as access the lab. So we have on-demand labs that a customer can click and right through their, their browser is delivered. Hmm. So they can actually test without buying any equipment at all? Yeah, that's yeah. the idea. Yeah, yeah. So well, it, it's, it's partnering yeah, awesome. with Dell to make sure we have the latest and greatest the, so that we can showcase it to them. And if they want to sign up, they can just go right off the website, right? Just go so, on to WWT.com. So, so yep. I'll include a link to that as well. And how about in your area? So I have a great example of that. Um, Dell just released their DM5500, their new integrated appliance, and we were getting one in the ATC. Um, I was planning on flying out Monday afternoon, do the install Tuesday, Wednesday. I get a call Monday morning from one of our account teams. It's like, can we POC a DM5500? I'm like, not right now. <laughs> but you know, we're going to get this stood up and um, I'll let you know how it goes. Call them back Wednesday afternoon when we finished up. 
and we had one in the lab. Wow. Yeah, Friday you actually, afternoon, we you actually get stuff it. before they're even generally available sometimes, right? Sometimes we do, yeah. yeah we're, in, we're in a couple of advanced programs. In this case, it was something that was out. Um, you know, we were one of the first uh, partners to get it up and running in the lab, and it was a great deployment experience. We POC'd that on Friday, and I think within the next week, the PO, the PO was caught. So the ability to instantly demo, do POCs without, you know, the customer having to drop any hardware on-prem, um, and of course, we have all of the hands-on lab capabilities. Yeah. So if you want to go see that Dell Cyber Recovery solution, we can spin that right up, demo it, show all the facets. And I've looked through some of those labs. In some cases, you actually give step-by-step -step directions on how to run the lab Absolutely, as well. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So you, you, you simplify it as much as you can. Yep, uh, we have lab guides, so you can either follow along or if you just want to go at your own pace, yep. free to do that as well. All right, well, thanks for the description of your sessions. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to replicate those you know, in the, in the WW2 environment. Uh, and uh, so on behalf of, um, of Steve and Michael, thanks for joining me. I'm Zia Skarovoff from ZK Research, and I'll see you next time in another video.